Uh, I'm going to be presenting today on the technical challenges of large spill response uh, and remediation. Uh, main focus of this is going to be on wetland spills because that has been the majority of my uh, career. So, uh, but I'll try to touch a little bit more on some of the upland spills as well that I've dealt with. Uh, in order to understand the, uh, the challenges involved with uh, spill response, it's good to understand the challenges that are uh, involved in all the phases of the spill response. That includes uh, initial response, containment recovery, assessment, and remediation. Uh, so initial response, it's uh, Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, Christmas morning, you're unwrapping presents with your kids, phone rings, something's happened somewhere. You've got to get people on the ground as quickly as possible um, as field level responders. And then those people that are left behind are going to be doing project oversight, doing desktop studies, uh, aerial photographs, what type of receptors are in that immediate area, such as wetlands, water bodies. Um, <clears throat> you're going to be researching production data. You're also going to be looking at any historical spill information that might be involved as well. Uh, all this information is going to be required for when that field level responder arrives on site because he's going to need it to help direct his assessment. So your field level responder has arrived. Uh, he's meeting up with operations, uh, the safety people, anybody else that's going to be involved in this response. Uh, and you need to establish your roles and responsibilities. Um, most of us here that are in the environmental consulting world, you're dealing with uh, specific clients that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you already have that hierarchy set up. You know when you arrive on site, you're going to be doing assessment. Or you're going to be doing everything including hiring the logistics, hiring um, all the equipment that's going to be involved with that spill response. You usually have that set up in place. In some cases, when you get into larger spill response, you're going to end up working underneath what's called the incident command system. This is also known as ICS. ICS is essentially a hierarchical organization system that's used or was developed by forest fighters down in the United States and it's been implemented in the spill response, um, any type of disasters, even weddings. Uh, initial response. So now you've arrived on site, you're, you've established what your role and responsibility is, you need to access that site. Um, best case scenario, that spill is going to happen across the road from your house. It never happens. You're always going somewhere where it's going to be remote, poor access. So you need to figure out what are the logistical requirements in order to get yourself from point A to point B so that you can start controlling that spill. So I'm going to get into a little bit of the access challenges that we've dealt with in the past. Uh, once again, the main focus is going to be on wetland situations, bogs, fens. Um, some of these challenges, uh, traditionally, dealing with operations, dealing with drilling people, uh, production uh, ends of the industry, traditionally they want to use rig mats. They understand it. It's what they use in their day-to-day -day operations. But they need to understand that the systems that they're going to be accessing don't necessarily respond well to rig mat access. So as you can see here, we've had to rig mat out to this site and it's causing a lot of detrimental damage to the, uh, to the ecosystem itself. So before you start throwing rig mats onto the ground, you need to ask yourself, what am I accessing the site for? What is my purpose once I get out there? For this project, our purpose and main focus was to recover fluid. That's the only thing we wanted to do. Under an emergency response, operations wanted to recover fluid into a flock tank right next to the bell hole. That's not absolutely necessary. So some of the solutions that we've dealt with, and people laugh when I show them the picture of the helicopter, we'll get into that a little bit more, um, is that a lot of these sites that you can, act, that you can deal with uh, when you're dealing with fluid recovery in fens, is that you can actually do a lot of work on foot or with low ground pressure equipment. Um, so in order to access these sites, we've actually started developing walkway systems. Uh, just using rough cut lumber, pallets, basically anything that you can get out to these sites without causing too much damage to the ecosystem because even the ground pressure of a human walking through a fen is going to destroy that ecosystem over time. So in the picture on the right hand side, just in case you weren't aware, that's actually that access uh, pipeline right away. So you can see the damage that the uh, rig mats did to the site. This is about a year and a half after. So some of the solutions, when you're comparing the two of them, um, one of the other big things is when people see a helicopter long-lining equipment into a site, automatically they see dollar signs and they think it's going to be overly too expensive. So to touch base on that a little bit, in order to mobilize the rig mats you've seen in those pictures, it took us about four days. This is using multiple pieces of equipment including four truck and trailer units, two bed trucks, a track hole with a mat grapple, uh, swampers, other pieces of equipment Init and ended up being about $80,000 to mobilize those mats to the site. That's just to get it there. Add another $80,000 to get it out of there as well. 
Um, and then on top of that, some clients own their own swamp mats. In this case, they didn't. So you're looking at a rental fee of about $324,000 for three months worth of rental for those swamp mats. Now our solution to build that walkway, exact same distance, it was about 800 meters or so, uh, using a helicopter to long line the equipment in, ended up being about $35,000. No rental charges, no damage to the ecosystem, using a long line for about seven hours and just a handful of uh, local people as laborers building the walkways for us. So if they ever question me on dollars and cents, I'll lend this to you and you can show it to them. So some of the, also, some of the other uh, benefits of using these walkways is that you actually allow the ecosystem to maintain functionality. The grass is gonna continue to grow through the openings in the wood. Your, your water is gonna continue to flow through the system. It's not being held up by something. Um, a rig mat access is essentially the same as a berm. It's gonna stop water flowing through the system naturally, which is actually what you want it to do. You want the system to work with you, not hold it up, and then basically not benefit your site afterwards. Some other situations that we've ran into, rig mats, pallet walkways, boardwalk walkways aren't gonna work all, at all. We're dealing with open water bodies, beaver impoundments. Um, in these cases, you're basically, you're stuck to, uh, approaching these sites by the air. Traditionally, we've used helicopters, where you basically have a helicopter with pontoons, you land on the water body, you collect a sample. If you're not lucky enough to have pontoons, you hang out of the side of the helicopter and you dip your bottle in the water. With the advancements that we're starting to see in drone technology, this is something I haven't had the opportunity to do yet, but I'm hoping that someday we'll be able to, is basically attach a bottle to a drone, fly it into your water body and collect a sample. So now you've arrived on your site, you've basically been there for a couple hours. How do you contain? That's the biggest thing you need to worry about once you've arrived at a location, contain and stabilize this, this site. Um, this can be done with isolation containment techniques such as an aqua dam that you see in the top right, soil berms, um, sheet piling here in the top right. Essentially it's steel uh, sheets of metal that are pounded into the ground into a confining layer. That's going to completely cut your spill off from the rest of the ecosystem. Um, you can also use passive containment systems that we're showing here in the bottom. Basically just bell holes and trenches, allowing that fluid to continue moving through the system but monitoring and being able to control it with the use of pumps and uh, data collection. So one of the biggest things we're finding as we're going into these northern communities is resources and supplies. It's the biggest challenge we're running into. You don't have a UFA farm store, you don't have a PV mark, you don't have anything. Uh, so basically you gotta use what you, what you have readily available. Um, for North Shore and for most companies that have dedicated spill teams, they have an emergency response trailer unit or they use WCSS that'll supply them with the basic necessities that you'll be using on that location. In some cases, you don't have that available. So you basically use what you, what you can basically get your hands on. Um, what we're showing here in the top right and the left is essentially bales supplied from a local farmer. Um, on the right hand side, we're just using it to basically stop surface flow. On the left hand side, we've actually used a poly liner uh, that we brought from Nilex and we sunk it into a confining layer, folded it over the bales and made an impermeable uh, barrier from the spills, uh, spill fluid from traveling through that system. Um, these pictures are a few years old. I'm not a huge fan of using bales, especially in forested sites. Um, so basically you can make a berm out of anything. You want to stack up logs, use logs. If you're using the impermeable barrier, all it needs is something to get it above the water line. So, uh, the bottom right hand corner uh, is actually the site that uh, we were accessing with the rig mats. Uh, we didn't have much for supplies on that site um, and we didn't have any access to any supplier really at the time and there was heavy precipitation forecasted for that, uh, that location. We had hydrocarbon impacts on this area around the breakpoint that we needed to isolate from the rest of the spill. So we basically beg, borrowed and stole poly liners out of our gravel trucks used the chain, some T-posts, and sunk that into a confining layer and covered the remainder of the spill with the rest of the poly liner and basically cut that part of the spill off from the rest of the system. Uh, so isolation containment techniques, uh, like the sheet piling. One thing you've got to keep in consideration when you're using these types of systems is that it's going to isolate absolutely everything. Not just your spill fluids, it's also going to isolate precipitation, surface runoff, snow melt. Everything is going to be held up by that barrier and it's not necessarily going to be impacted. So what Norsher has done, and I've been told to say this is patent pending, um, 
we've installed valves onto the sheet piling. Uh, that way you can collect samples from the surface water that's piling up behind the sheet piling barrier. If it meets a certain set of uh, guidelines or standards, you can actually open a valve and release a controlled amount of that fluid back and allow it to move through the system. So you've got it contained. You figure you've got everything relatively stabilized based on what you can visually see in what your first few minutes of initial assessment has told you. Now it's time to start recovering that fluid. Everybody's, everybody has seen the collection of oil on water, I'm sure, either through pictures or the news media or whatever. Uh, it's basically just lake booms, river booms. And then you're also applying an absorbent boom in there to corral oil fluid from the water material, from the water surface into a recovery point. It's a hundred times, million times easier to collect oil off of water than it is to collect it off the shoreline. So the more you can collect out in the actual water body itself will make your life easier if you let it get into the shoreline itself. Some of the other containment and recovery techniques that we've used um, with surface water or surface trenches here, and we know we're going to be on this site for a long period of time. It's not always the best practice to leave an open trench in the middle of the forest. There's wildlife, there's uh, people, there's trappers, there's hunters, everybody walking through these systems when you're not around to stop them. So one thing that we've attempted to do is basically mimic a French drain system. And this is done by using your woody slash material rather than mulching it up and disposing of it. Backfill your, your surface trenches with them, cover it with a jute cloth or with a, with a coconut matting, and then backfill it with your excavated material. This way, fluid still travels through the trench, but it's completely covered. You can access over top of it without any issues, uh, no risk of injury. And you can also start willow staking like you're seeing in the right-hand side here and actually start site regeneration before your remediation has really even had a chance to take off. So, site's contained, hopefully stabilized. And while you've been doing that, your one junior, or in some cases 15, are running around and they're starting to collect data. You need to get an assessment completed so that you understand the site in general. Um, first thing you're going to want to do, basically during the phone call, you're going you're to be talking to an operator or to your client representative, and he's going to tell you, we had two cubes spilled into a system. I'm pretty sure it's oil emulsion. You arrive on site and you start a conversation with, the op with operations. You find out then that they've been adding methanol to the line or a nickel-based corrosion inhibitor. All of, these, all of this information has to be used so that you can adjust it and basically uh, change your sampling parameters accordingly. Um, source characterization. Best case scenario, you can grab a sample directly from the pipeline. That sample is going to tell you what parameters it's failing for so that you can apply that to the site. Uh, if you can't do that, find out where the source for the pipeline is. Operations can typically take you there and you can fill your sample bottles there. And if that's not available to you, find your worst case locations. This isn't, doesn't necessarily mean your breakpoint location. Say for instance, if a pipeline broke on the top of a hill, flowed down gradient into a low lying area. Typically the fluid that you're going to find pooled in that low lying area is going to have higher concentrations than what's going to be found on the top of that hill. So take that into consideration whenever you're grabbing for characterization. And then another thing that's really important is identifying the ecosystems that you're dealing with and how much area has been affected by this spill. So ecosystem classification. You're going to establish what your receptors are. What is being affected by this release? What sensitive species are in this area by doing wildlife studies? Uh, and then you can determine what the proper assessment technique is going to be for each of those ecosystems. And this is basically going to be utilized when you're trying to determine what's the best sample medium for that release or for that area of your release. For mineral soils, everybody's collected the soil in a jar, soil in a bag, off an auger, or through a hand auger, through a shovel. Every client here or every consulting firm probably has established <coughs> interval depths that they take samples from, um, and then you can submit those for reported results that you can apply to the Tier 1 guidelines. So they're trustworthy, no problem. Organic samples, however, there's several factors that are going to influence the results that you're going to be reported from the labs. So data interpretation. Data needs to be interpreted. Um, you need to start focusing on the effects that the moisture content saturation percentage is going to have on the effects on your detection limits, um, on the effects of elevated concentrations. They're going to, you're going to see concentrations being elevated above a tier one guideline, but are they necessarily biogenic or petrogenic sourced? 
So you need to be able to interpret that information with the help of the people at your lab. So tier one in the organics. Uh, organic contaminants, BTEX, F1, F4s, uh, PAHs, methanols. These are gonna be initially applied to a coarse textured soil and groundwater remediation guideline. Uh, for inorganic contaminants, you need to look into it a little bit more. Um, in some cases, you even have to use a tier two approach. So for organic parameters, hydrocarbons, pHs, the analysis is gonna be performed on a wet weight basis. There's a lot of people here from the lab, so if I get any of this wrong, you guys can correct me later on, but um, it's on a wet weight basis, but it's gonna be reported in a dry weight basis. And because of that, there's a correction factor applied, which is the inverse of the moisture content. So when you're dealing with organic material, you're dealing with upwards of 90% moisture content when it comes to organic parameters. That can lead to a correction factor of anywhere of about 10 times magnification in your detection limits and in the results that are being reported. So this doesn't necessarily happen with every sample and that's why it can get confusing and hard to justify later on in a report. So it's always good, good uh, practice to collect background controls. Lab interpretations. Every single lab has got that guy locked in a back room somewhere that's gonna be interpreting chromatograms. Utilize that guy. He's, he's a wealth of knowledge and he can actually help you write off a lot of the potentially naturally occurring organic parameters that are, that are gonna occur in these organic systems. Just make sure that whatever he gives you is a definitive black and white yes or no. If there's any gray area, then you haven't really solved the problem yet. And then also keep in mind that these chromatograms are only available for F2 to F4s as well as uh, toluene in some cases. So I wanted to touch a little bit on toluene because that's actually an issue that we ran into just recently. Um, two types of toluene, petrogenic, biogenic. Petrogenic, it's a component of hydrocarbons. So oils, gases, diesels, uh, even adhesives and tapes. Um, so keep that in mind when you're doing legal samples. The tape that you might be using around those sample bottles could affect your, your analysis. Um, the one good thing with petrogenic toluene is it's typically re reported with another uh, light-end hydrocarbon such as benzene or ethyl benzene. Uh, biogenic toluene, uh, it's a natural component. It's common in wetlands. Uh, it's typically associated with the decomposition of vegetation, uh, anaerobic conditions. And one of the good things is if it's biogenic, it's typically only reported on its own. So once you see that, it's good to start looking into it a little bit deeper. Uh, so biogenic uh, toluene, what we've started using just recently is uh, the use of a forensic lab as opposed to just a normal uh, environmental lab uh, in order to run biogenic toluene analysis. Um, what's done here is we start looking at intermediate chem chemicals that are typically associated with it. Uh, and these are the result of terpenes. Terpenes breaking down into p-cymines that break down into toluene. Um, We've done this because the routine BTEX analysis doesn't necessarily pick up on these intermediate chemicals. So the biogenic toluene analysis will identify the origin of key alkylated benzenes, uh, the p-cymines, toluenes, benzaldehyde, which are generally associated to the breakdown of vegetation. Uh, it also allows you to have a lower detection limit, roughly a thousand times lower than what you would get in a normal BTEX analysis. And it's also presented as a chromatogram. So as you can see on the left-hand side is a control sample from one of our sites. It reported a toluene uh, concentration above tier one guidelines, and due to the stakeholders involved in the site, it was flagged as a contaminant of concern. So we submitted it for the uh, biogenic toluene analysis. It came back with this graph, which they could apply to the uh, graph on the right-hand side, which is a crude oil sample. So then you're actually able to interpret these, uh, these results and write it off as a naturally occurring uh, concentration. So one of the things I, I, I want to stress the most is uh, in wetland systems, your background control sampling is very important. For most cases, taken from a phase two perspective, you're going to be going to two control locations and you're going to be grabbing samples from however deep you're, you're drilling. In a wetland system, starting at 10 controls is probably a good start. Um, and that's because you've literally introduced a foreign substance into a stable site that is going to be taken out of stability by absolutely everything. Um, the release fluids, the amount of disturbance that you're causing on the site, using rig mats, walking on it, you name it. Anything out there is going to release chemicals into this system 
that aren't necessarily associated with your spill, but just the naturally occurring chemicals that are going on in that system. So the more controls that you can collect, the more information you're going to have to justify your site later on down the road. Um, one of the other things I should touch on, and this, there's no scientific proof behind any of this. This is something that we've kind of noticed over the, t over the years. Um, similar disturbance levels. When you're doing wetland spills, you're typically setting up sample points within your release path that you're accessing every single day for months, weeks. So the level of disturbance there is causing um, disturbance in the vegetation, disturbance in the soil that's being released into the water. When you're working on your control sample points, you're typically accessing them a couple times. So the level of disturbance that's being allowed to happen in those control samples doesn't necessarily mimic what's going on in your release path. So essentially it leads to just mucking around with your boots. So make sure you do equipment blanks or decontaminate before you do it, but that's all that we've really found and we're actually starting to identify an increase in biogenic toluene after the system has been further disturbed. So one of the things I wanted to touch on, and I'm not really familiar with it because I've just kind of been made aware of it, is the new uh, BTEX and F1 sampling procedures that are going to be implemented into uh, Alberta here at the beginning of March, I believe. Terracores and methanol preservation. How is this going to be affected, or how is this going to affect peat sampling? You're only collecting a small terracore into a 40 milliliter vial, I believe, preserved with um, methanol. Is that going to be enough sample based on the fact that you need bulk density? So something to think about and something that I've kind of got feelers out to figure out, um, but I'm not quite sure just yet. So, uh, Inorganic parameters. Uh, we're talking salts, talking uh, metals. This is going to be performed on a dry weight basis. Uh, so in this situation, you need to start taking into consideration the saturation percentage that's being reported for that sample. Uh, keep in mind that it's only going to affect your soluble ions, chloride, sodiums. It's not really going to have an effect on ECSARs and pH. So your saturation percentage. Um, basically the main thing to focus on here is the organics. Uh, organics have the ability to saturate up to 100 to 3,000% its own mass. This is going to have a huge effect on some of your reported results. Because basically they dry, they grind, they resaturate, and they collect the sample off of the filtrate of that resaturated soil. And that saturation is going to be reported in milligrams per liter. But then it needs to be converted into a milligrams per kilogram so that you can apply it to the tier one guidelines. So this is going to be done using the saturation percentage. So generally for mineral soils, <clears throat> you're going to be using uh, your milligrams per kilogram res reported result is generally going to be slower than your milligrams per liter. So there's no issue. For organic peat soils, your milligrams per kilogram can actually be reported up to 30 times higher than the milligrams per liter. So in just a general example, uh, 100 milligrams per liter of chlorides, not an issue. Um, but then you apply it to a peat that has a percent, saturation percentage of 2,000, and all of a sudden you can get a reported result of 2,000 milligrams per kilogram, which is going to be a red flag for the regulator, for your client, basically anybody involved. Here's another example from a site we actually just finished working on. Uh, we collected a peat sample from an excavation wall. Uh, it's the middle of January, we couldn't collect water, uh, so we were stuck sampling peat. Had a saturation percentage of about 983. EC was reported at 0.662, no problem according to the tier one guidelines. However, the milligrams per kilogram reported result for chloride was 1,430. This sample was actually flagged by the regulator and we were told that we had to do something with it. My response to that was to tell the regulator to flip the page to the salinity tables that showed milligrams per liter only had 146. A Little bit of discussion later, we were allowed to leave that sample in place because it wasn't an issue. So a sample medium, general uh, rule of thumb, if you've got impacts in mineral soils, just sample, sample the soil. If you've got inorganic impacts in organic soils uh, with the presence of water, sample the water. You're going to get a much better result from surface water samples than you will from a soil sample. Um, chloride wants to stay in solution. It wants to be in the water, not in the soil. So you're going to get a better, more trustworthy result if you sample the water. For organic impacts in organic soils, it's so basically up to you. Whatever you guys think is best for that site. Um, if you're sampling water, you're only sampling what's been dissolved into that water. So you might be missing something, uh, especially if you've got heavier end hydrocarbons, F3s, F4s. You're not typically going to get those in a water sample. Um, just keep in mind, though, if you do sample for peat soils, there's a lot of data interpretation. But use your labs. They'll help you out all the way. So do what's best for the site. All right, we've been there for about an hour now. We can figure out uh, how big this spill got. And that's all going to be dependent on release fluid.
How much volume has been released? Uh, what time? How much time is this spill allowed to occur? What type of ecosystems it's been released into? The, the topography, solubility, viscosity, uh, even the temperature. A spill that happens in January in minus 30 is not necessarily going to travel as far as that same spill happening in July in plus 30. So keep all that stuff in mind and use it when you're starting your assessment to figure out how big the spill has gotten. Um, so the initial assessment. It's boots on the ground trying to figure out how big this thing has gotten. So you need to just focus on surface impacts. Don't get too crazy about uh, figuring out what happened 15 meters down. You need to figure out how big and how far this thing has gotten. So focus on the surface. Use visual indicators for hydrocarbon spills. You're going to find staining of vegetation, staining on the soil, odors. Uh, all sorts of things are going to indicate where the hydrocarbons have gotten to. Um, for produced water, use, use a conservative species. And in this case, in, in basically 9.9 .9 out of 10 cases, it's going to be chloride. All field screening uh, equipment is designed to basically point you in the direction of chlorides, whether it be quantaps, multimeters. And even if you don't have any of that, dipping an EC probe into a pool of water will actually give you results that can at least point you in the right direction until you get the right equipment. Um, basically, we need to do this so we can confirm where the spill fluids have gone. Find that leading edge, horizontally delineate this spill so that you can ensure your containment activities are being done in the right place. Ensure that the recovery activities are being done in the right places as well. Um, without knowing the full extent of the spill, you can never really trust your containment and recovery activities until you've established that work area. 